welcome to another episode of Fans in Motion, your one-stop shop for Night Ranger talk. Not as good as the original one, but uh, mm. I think we'd make Andy proud. My name's Josh. I'm here with uh, my other ho- co-host here, Brent, and we have a little bit of a surprise for everyone today. Brent, you want to let them know what we got coming up? We're going to turn the microphone over to Joe Hoekstra of <laughs> White Snake. <laughs> well, White Snake, Cher, Trans Siberian Orchestra, formerly of the Turtles, which you will find out here, and most importantly, former lead, co lead guitarist for a great American band called Night Ranger. Uh, great episode we're going to split it up in two parts we talk for almost two hours with joel we cover his whole career from i have a question is this heaven no it's iowa we cover from him (laughs) (laughs) and he doesn't you know and he doesn't spend much time in iowa we find out but from basically him being raised in chicago to um, his career now, Echo Bats, we cover everything. And we actually find out a lot of fun stuff. We f- little sneak peeks is we, him and Christian kind of, their first, each of their first gig was together, and Joel recommended Christian. And yeah, that was really cool. I didn't know that. Either did I. And the other thing I took out of it was. Well, I think anybody that you know has followed Joel's career knows he's a very motivated motivated guy. He's always working, and a lot of people call things luck, but if you're motivated and you're ready, luck is usually opportunity. And it was great hearing that story when opportunity hit for him to go from Chicago to New York City. Won't go much more into it from there, but opportunity knocked and he was ready. And it basically kicked off his career and life in New York City, which eventually leads him to Night Ranger, to White Snake and Trans Siberian Orchestra, to eventually talking to us three Yahoos. You know what I found phenomenal was not only is he a great guitarist, a hell of a human being, he's one hell of an impressionist at the same time. <laughs> if we would have let him and Andy go at it. God knows where that would have led. You will, if you stick around, you will see uh, Joel do his impersonation of Eric Levy. So we'll have to get, we'll have to talk and, to Eric. And, and the teaser. <laughs> well, that, that's it. I'm, I'm only going to give you this. Or, or. <laughs> that's the way he introduced himself in concert. So. Ugh. If you're jo- if if this is the first episode you've ever seen, I think this is going to be episode maybe eleven or twelve. Um, if it's fourteen. Is it? Well, if you count episode zero, it's fourteen. Yeah, Otherwise, it's thirteen. Well, <laughs> I, well, there's a lot of episodes. So if this is your first time yeah. uh, seeing the podcast, uh, Click on the subscribe button. We release a Night Ranger oriented pod, uh, podcast episode every Tuesday. Also, go to Facebook. Just type in Fans in Motion Night Ranger. We actually are tied in. Is actually what started was the Fans in Motion Facebook page. Have over a thousand members. Very active page. A lot of great hardcore fans. We're always posting different photos and just everything. So if, if and we celebrate all eras of the band. And we, it's it's a positive page. We don't, there's no politics. If you're a negative person, I give you the boot. There's no negativity. It's just all positive. And if you want to go be a negative person, you can go somewhere else and do it. So it's just a fun page. Everybody has fun. Everybody's respectful. So go check it out. Um, what do we got? So... Notes from the previous episode. Our previous episode is was the episode of Don't Tell Me Your Set List, which is where we basically took the scenario. 2020's been canceled due to coronavirus, no concerts. What would be a realistic set list for 2021? 
basically we got to throw in the hits, but how do you throw in some of those deep cuts that, you know, hardcore fans enjoy? And we got a lot of great feedback. It was interesting seeing um, what people thought. It was fun seeing some of their set lists and what songs it, it incorporated. And that, that, that's what I like about doing stuff like that. Just everybody has different ideas and there's no right and there's no wrong. I mean, mine's right. Everybody else is wrong. <laughs> but, you know, the political correct uh, thing to say is there's no right and there's no wrong. Brent, yours there's, only, there's only me. Yours was pretty wrong. Um, but, no, uh, mine was pretty damn good. So, I'd, I'd have paid $150 to see that show. <laughs> so yeah, Not was, a penny more. You know, so it was fun seeing everybody's ideas on their own 2021 set list. As for Night Ranger news, there's obviously not a lot going on with, um, with everything that's going on. But, yes, Night Ranger did perform a concert i think august 11th at sturgis there's some footage out there the biggest takeaway i got was carrie kelly now has a goatee so there you go uh hopefully you know we see something in the future where i don't know if it's going to be one of those limited capacity type shows or anything like that but we had that starlight theater in Butler PA that was scheduled and canceled. So hopefully something comes up. It's, it would be nice to be able to, that's the only thing that's kind of, you know, been a disappointment in this whole you know thing is we start this fan page and we start the podcast and there's no concerts. I mean, think how much fun that would be to everybody on the page. Hey, we're going to Cincinnati and being yeah. able to meet up with other fans on there so as popular as the page has become and as much fun as it is there, we still haven't I don't think reached the uh, apex of what it can be but other than well, that, the that sorry so the positive thing was with them playing the show from what I had seen on YouTube without a rehearsal they didn't skip a beat they were fantastic yeah. they're a good tight band yep so as for anything else that's new, I don't have it readily available. I don't even know what the heck. Did I even open it? The the Damn Yankees reissue from uh, Rock Candy. Yeah. That did come in. I just don't know what the hell I did with it. I'll show it next episode. But uh, So there is something new out there. The booklet is great. It does have two additional live tracks of High Enough and Where Are You Going Now. So if you got some money piling up and you don't know what to do with it, Go buy uh, the uh, new damn Yankees uh, reissue from Rock Candy of Don't Tread. I have something new, but I got to get up for eight seconds and get it real quick. Eight seconds. Eight seconds. Count it. All right. So, oh, also, you will find out in this episode. Dang. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Like the flash. Hold on. That was too quick. In, a... in this episode, we actually, and I, I'm surprised I didn't know this. Um, there was a replacement guitarist for Joel for a while in 2011 I have at least confirmed that uh, before Carrie started replacing him uh, I can't remember his name now uh, I sent it to you I posted it on the page today. so if, listen if uh -oh. you're on the Fans in Motion uh, Facebook page you would have saw footage of him performing with uh, Night Ranger where the heck oh, did you post that today? I hadn't seen it yet. Yeah, I found some uh, Epcot stuff. Uh, yeah, Tristan, I'm... Tristan Av Avakian, Avakian. So yeah, someone that... probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what? We'll yes. Ask, we'll ask Tom Shapen and uh, Dave Glasser. <laughs> Shapen, Shapen. Uh, so what do you got? What do you got for us? I have. A Jesse Bradman autograph from my um, from my from my um, Josh Baca over here, my co-pilot. <laughs> you froze you, up a little bit. Get a Jesse. Jesse. What's that? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. To Brent, keep rocking, Jesse Bradman. Actually, I signed that on my kitchen table for you. If you send it back to me, I'll get you a Jeff Lawson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you will. Uh, and, um. And I will get you um, an Alan Fitzgerald. 
Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, uh, yeah, me and Jesse go way back. So, there is that. What else we got? What else we got? Well, on the Fans of Motion page, we've had some cool posts this week. This one comes from a- uh, Amy Pereira Johnson. She posted some concert pics that she had taken, and they were used by some um, websites. I thought that was kind of notable, and I pulled it up. And then we have the rockin' John Reed. John did a little rendition of Don't Tell Me You Love Me and was was fantastic. We love seeing that kind of stuff. John is soon going to be learning lead guitar. <laughs> That's what he said he couldn't play lead guitar. But um, we appreciated it, both of you. Thank you, everybody that posts. Thank you very much. And I have, you know, I was telling Josh, you know, I called him... Um, my co-pilot, Chewbacca, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Or was that, yeah, two weeks ago? I anyway, I, I thought about coming up with limited edition fan emotion trading cards. And there's Josh Baca right there. Jesus. Having a great time Jeez. on his. That's the very first promotional fan emotion trading card. I figured you'd like that. <laughs> you need help. You, need you help. didn't know I was going to do that. So, um... No, well, I'll, I, do, I'll do one of Andy because he'll skip all this when he goes to watch the Joel Hoekster. He won't. He won't have a clue. Uh, yeah. Took the words right out of your mouth. Look at that, speechless. Anyways, I don't know what the hell I'll say uh, about that. I'm a comic relief. Um, you should have used the '87 tops wood border. I like that stuff. Um, hey, this was the um, this was what second series number two of New Hope. That's what I used. Anything new? There, you, got the, there it is. you got the logo in there. Fans of motion. I see that. And I got my old Louisville Bats hat on. I, I just threw that hat away after five years. It's See? Well, this is a collector's card then. Yeah. It was a, it was a good hat. I was emotionally attached to it. But um, I liked it because it stunk so bad that I was actually social distancing before it was cool because of it. People didn't want to come near me. But, Such a uh, trendsetter. Um, so, new stuff. One of these days we'll do a, uh, we'll do a, a vinyl episode on the 45s, but we were talking about Seven Wishes. We, one of the things on the episodes that we've done is we've done album focus. Uh, so far we've done Dawn Patrol, Midnight Madness, and Seven Wishes. And we we'll highlight some of the vinyl on there. And when we did seven wishes, it really showed how big they had become because they pressed that album in so many countries and just something I got the other day. It is a, well, I don't know if it's actually a 45 or technically a 33 single, but, uh, of sentimental street from what country is that from South Africa. So well, that CBS threw me on there. That's why I don't think that CBS is the original sleeve. Okay, gotcha. Uh, I can't say for sure because CBS did do some distributing. Yeah. Uh, but it's just it almost looks like an uh, England forty-five. Yeah, the European ones are great. Yeah. But it's uh, it's with the exception of the European, a lot of them were molded. The titles are molded into the vinyl. Yeah, Night Rangers got one like that for uh, Secret of My Success. Do they? Yep. Well, you'll be showing that uh, soon. Well, yeah, yeah. Because that's probably what we're going to do sometime after this Joel Hoekstra interview. But South Africa, not an easy one to come by. And one of the episodes that we had done, I don't know, a few weeks ago, is where we did the vinyl, like a vinyl collector's episode where we show all the different pressings of Dawn Patrol. And just, I saw a a promo copy of Dawn Patrol that was only like five bucks somewhere. I picked it up knowing that I already had it was the MCA promo. Well, when I got it and I compared it to my other one, I noticed one has, it says night, it says Dawn Patrol, then Night Ranger below it. And the other one says Night Ranger, then Dawn Patrol. Hold it up a little bit longer. Well, I'll I'll take pictures and show. Okay. Gotcha. But one will say Dawn Patrol. 
and then Night Rangers below it. The other one says Night Ranger, then Dawn Patrol below it. They're both promos. They're both MCA promos. I already knew about the two different pressing plants for Midnight Madness. I never got into the pressing plants for Dawn Patrol, but when I saw those, I knew, you know, knew that they were different. I looked at the pressing plants, and that is what it is. One, So both pressing plants printed promos. The Panickneyville pressing. So Panickneyville is the one MCA. Uh, you made that up, didn't you? It's a weird, it's a weird, <laughs> like looking, or it's, it's like you want to say picnic, Pinkneyville, but it's from P- what state? What state is that from? I think they're in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, it's P I N C K N E Y V I L L E. So, yeah. uh, Panic Panickneyville, something like that. Anyways, I'll ask Tom Shapen. He'll be able to tell me what it is. He's from PA. Uh, and then Gloversville is the other one. And what it is, as you can tell on the dead wax, they each have a little emblem. It's basically a line. And two diamonds, or a line with two squares, and that tells you what, f- you know, what factory it was pressed in. So, bam, those each factory was pressing promos. And the other thing it does show is they they actually eventually each factory eventually adds that camel management logo to the label. So eventually, those labels, those labels are the first. And then MCA will eventually on the Dawn Patrol U.S. pressings add that that camel logo. So there you go. You never know which uh, copy of Dawn Patrol you got. And even I learn something new every day. So if you're one of those few nerds out there that like to collect the Night Ranger vinyl, you can. Uh, there you go. You got something else to something else to to get. All right. Um, so anything else before we go into the uh, Joel Hoekstra interview? No, it's just if you're watching this for the first time and you discovered it because of Joel, we thank you for coming here. Yeah, definitely. Like the page, you know, like I said, you'll it, it, it's a good time. It's a good time. Great page. One of the best pages I've ever, ever been a part of. And like I said, we have it. We, we post a different episode every Tuesday. And our interviews, I mean, we, we like to – how did you get there? That's that's what I usually like to really focus on is I want to hear about all the hard work, the family and stuff that that was there before you had the big break. And we definitely get that in there. Like I said earlier, when we inter- when we introduced this um, episode, that phone call he gets to go from basically Chicago to New York City was. I, I like that whole story of, hey, I'll be back. And, you know, no, you won't. And mm. also even Christian, when, you know, Christian got the call, hey, you want to fill in? And, well, he ended up filling in for three or four years. So, but, yeah, it's great. We cover in this episode, we cover you know everything from the beginning, him basically starting his career, and you just see it piling up piling up he's getting you know more more mm. work more fame more responsibilities and i i just like those stories of well i needed to learn this and there's two guitar parts and i didn't know which one so i learned both i mean yeah. that's the stuff that puts you ahead of other people and and you do stuff like that at any job. You do, you know, do something equivalent at any job. You're going to succeed. So, Britt, unless you have anything else you want to add. I just want to say, Joel, thank you for taking the time to sit with us. It was great. And for all you Andy fans, Andy did join us for the, uh, for the, there he is. There he is, missing on the milk carton. For the uh, for the Joel interview, so sit back and relax and uh, enjoy our conversation with Joel Hoekstra. <laughs> Welcome to another exciting episode of Fans of Motion, and we are excited because we have 
the one and only guitarist for Whitesnake, Cher, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, uh, Echo Bats, the the new one uh, with uh, Mike Portnoy and then playing Jane, oh. and most importantly, former guitarist for the band called Night Ranger. Everybody welcome Joel Hoekstra. Yay! Yay. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored by the graphics. I mean, it's, uh, it's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of mine, you got the Joel Hoekstra somehow in the Night Ranger logo. That's amazing. Terrific. Hey, that, took, that took me some work. He, I, I bet it does. How are you doing, Matt? Do you have a program for that? No, like I, I literally use this mouse and paintbrush and lines, and I draw them and connect yeah. them. Get out. Are you serious? I swear to God. Oh, my the, gosh. That's like first, a, a lot of work you put in on yeah. that. Yeah, the um, first, the Fans in Motion logo took about 30 hours to design. And then I, I had to do my name. Then I had to do these two Yahoo's name. And... Now I'll do them for people on the page. It's kind of like prizes. And people are saying, hey, can you do mine? And they'll have 13 letters. Your, your name pushed the limit. <laughs> your last name. Well, thank you so much, man. I mean, what am I supposed to say to that? That's incredible that you did that. If you want it, I can email it to you after we're done. Yeah, that'd be cool. Thank you. It'd be nice to have that. So we've this will be our third interview we've done we interviewed eric lee or eric levy of night ranger probably a buddy of yours there joel fellow echo bat member recognize the name <laughs> he's he's a good guy I eric imitation too can i do my eric imitation we, uh, yes yeah. yes i had sunglasses that's all i did yeah, yeah. We're, we're definitely gonna try to have a, a good a good time <laughs> <laughs> kind of <laughs> yeah, kind of. We can't comment. We're not cool rock stars. You got to be doing this while you're doing Kirk it. Is the only guy, the only musician I know who doesn't play to his personality. Every other musician I know plays their instrument exactly like their personality. Eric uh, plays keyboards. I'm sure you guys see the jams. Yeah, yeah. Going miles an hour. Technique like crazy. Yet when he speaks, he talks slowly, and when he moves, he's like set, sets an item down. Like, <laughs> and then he gets on the keyboard, yeah. and it's like well, so. I, just an observation. It's really amazing. Uh, most musicians I know, all of them are yeah. Played now, just, yeah. so yeah. you did, did you speak to him before you did this interview? Did you know yeah. about his interview on our show? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I mean, I think when we're setting it up, I okay. think Josh told me about it. Yeah, it was three hours. We won't do that to you tonight. <laughs> okay. Well, so unless you pull out the guitar for three hours, I, I'm still working on being interesting for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so here's something that I'm going. I'm throwing out a left field. Eric told us a story about when you had left the band. His luggage tag was number five, and Todd made him move it up to number four. You know what I'm talking about there? Your luggage what? your luggage tags? You luggage each, tag. Yep. My question, I forgot to ask Eric, who was number one? Uh, every every email, uh, every everything. Jack, Jack Blades, Brad Gillis, Kelly Kagi, Joel Hoekstra, Eric Levy at my yeah, time. So, That's so just the way it went. That tells you number one. So is. I'm not saying he was number one. I'm just... <laughs> Yeah, that's right. how they show up. <laughs> oh, that? There we go. That's a that's a that's a safe answer. All right. Okay. So I'm not officially on the record with that, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Yeah. Um. So we'll go ahead and jump into this uh, interview here if everyone's ready. Let's do it. I got a question. Is this heaven? <laughs> no, it's Iowa. So the rumor is that you were born in Iowa. Is that correct? I was indeed. And I'm not sure at exactly what age, but as an infant, my family moved to the burbs of Chicago. So often the story is born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago, but technically born in Iowa City. All right. So I will say is that the you're the only Night Ranger member born in Iowa, but they seem to get a lot of members from Chicago, Illinois. So where in Chicago were, were you raised? So Orland Park, southwest suburb, known for its malls. <laughs> and the uh, Orland Park uh, Prairie, I think, too. 
Is that your uh, local newspaper there? And uh, I, so, yeah. I did a little research. John Kangalosi, former uh, outfielder for the Chicago White Sox, was born there as well. Yeah, okay. right. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so were, were you a White Sox or a Cubs fan? Uh, Cubs fan because they were on TV more when I was a kid. Right. So it was really that simple. I was from the area. We were supposed to be a Sox fan, but – didn't work out that way. <laughs> the Cubs were on TV every day. I yeah. watched them every day. And next thing you know, a week later, you're like, I like the Cubs. Yeah. My, it broke my dad's heart, I think. Harry Cow, he would be happy. <laughs> Sorry, that was terrible. <laughs> but he would be happy. Well, that was, that, and that's the way, even in Ohio, there is, and I think that's probably why there's so many Cubs fans around the world, is mm-hmm. WGN. I, yeah, I grew, 1987 Cubs. I remember being a 10 year old kid and watching them every day. Andre Dawson, Ryan Sandberg, just because, like you said, Jewel, they were on TV. Now I still hate the Cubs, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, and I did. My I, here's getting on the Cubs is I my three year old son's name is Dawson, and I, how we named him. The Cubs won the World Series, and what 2016. And I was thinking, man, I hate the Cubs, but I did enjoy watching 1987 Andre Dawson. Who the, didn't? The Hawk. And that is how, that moment of time, I was like, Dawson. That'd be a great name. I presented it to, uh, yeah. to, to, awesome. yeah. What a, what a great player. Amazing arm. Such a pro, man. Hit ridiculous. It was the, I think that you're 47 home runs, right? 49 home runs. I well, I don't, yeah. It was yeah. a, he, that, where he won MVP when they were yeah. last play. Yeah. He won MVP and 49 home runs was a lot of home runs in 1987. Yeah, yeah, back then. Yeah. I mean, I remember Absolutely. Andre Thornton for the Indians hit 31, and you couldn't hardly even believe he hit 31. But yeah. en- we enough of the. Uh, <laughs> but you get me talking about baseball. I'll go on all night. Yeah, I know. This whole thing could be about that. Me too. Because <laughs> I'm from the Chicago area. Right? Yeah. That's what you do. You talk I'm, I'm just shocked you didn't bring up Jody Davis. Jody, Jody, Jody Davis. Davis. Well, you had Jody King Davis. Of the Cubs Frontier. You had uh, what? <laughs> Weird batting stance. Like hunched yeah. over. Keith Moreland and uh, Rick Sutcliffe. Oh man, Ryan Sandberg. Awesome. Yeah, Sandberg. Oh, that's, that's... Andy has no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a baseball fan. Yeah, yeah. So you know, the Bears. Of people or... listening to this that have no idea yeah. what we're talking about right now, like get to the get to the music stuff, please. <laughs> Well, I figured it might play be guitar or something. And John Kangalosi, like I said, was from Orland Park. He actually played for the White Sox, I think, that year. But oh. anyway, so you hey, wait, wait one second, jo- um, Joel. Have you ever done anything with the Cubs, like doing the take me out to the ball game or national anthem or I anything? Have, I, I sent them a an email to the anthem email address this is an email address you can write in and i was like hey i'm a cubs fan i play with these bands whatever maybe but i think you they just wanted me to maybe submit it like a video of me playing it and i don't know i didn't hear back so (laughs) they threw me off you know uh but i've done it at the knicks game here in new york city madison square garden all on my own there you go and uh i've done it for a new jersey devils game here uh with somebody singing with me I'm trying to think if I've done it more than those two times. That might be it. So I've done, I've done it a couple times. So were your were your parents musical or siblings musical? Yeah, totally. My my parents were like insane classical musicians, so really talented. So the the bar was really high. And uh, I think because they were both classical musicians, they had dreams of one of their kids being a virtuoso, right? So like they had two kids, and like which one? And my sister had the head start on piano. I, they started me on cello when I was three, I think, and then I was three. I, I remember playing Old MacDonald Hill Farm for my preschool. We're not talking about playing Bach. I mean, it was like, <laughs> and then uh, and then I started piano, and my sister was like kicking my ass, right? Because she had already been playing, and it, like that's the worst when you're the younger sibling. So I was like, I hate piano. I don't want to do this. Uh, so I mean, I, I played for a couple of years, what? but. Uh, were your parents well, yeah. the ones teaching you, or did you have? Uh, sometimes, and then sometimes we had a teacher outside, so it wasn't weird, and your parents weren't like an uh, instructor. All right. All uh, right. But yeah, I, at that time, I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to be a baseball player. I used to pitch all day. Like that's what I wanted to do was be a, a major league baseball pitcher. So music wasn't really my my first love. Baseball was, which is probably why we started mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. And then. 
music like all of a sudden came. <laughs> Bam! All it took was ACDC, man, you know, back oh, in yeah. black and hearing that and seeing Angus Young and going, oh my God, I gotta, I want to be that guy. That guy's the coolest dude in the world. And then everything changed right there. So I asked my parents for a guitar and I think they were picturing like, yeah, oh, maybe he wants to be Segovia. <laughs> Play classical guitar. And obviously I had other plans, but um, in the end it all worked out. You, you never, you never fell down, fell down the kiss well. Uh, no, I wasn't a kiss guy. I missed it somehow. Well, I missed set the seventies because by the time I was in, when was Back in Black? 81, 82? I don't even know. Nineteen eighties when it was released. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, nineteen eighty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. So that's when I got in. So I kind of missed that initial initial kiss window, mm -hmm. but I am. Obviously, because I kind of grew up more on them being into music uh, with the the makeup off. I do like some of those tunes. I mm -hmm. like Licking Up. I think that's nice a jam, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I like Heaven's on Fire. I think that's a cool... <laughs> so a lot of those, the stuff that you're yeah. not supposed to like as a Kiss fan. You're supposed to say you like Gold Gin and you know, yes. whatever. I, I, that, I've, that, been a, I've been a Kiss fan since Destroyer came out, and I love all eras of the band. You know, Asylum is one of my all-time favorite Kiss albums, and everybody says Andy's like how, <laughs> and I love it. Well, just keep it real, man, because I, yeah. I I missed the I missed the Kiss is cool window when I was in the '70s. I was a, just a little too young and just a little late in getting into into it all. So what did not? I, I listen to Back in Black. It might have been like for those about to rock was coming out. Yeah. So mm -hmm. eighty one, eighty two. In fact, I think for those about to rock was really the one I bought first. I think what I did is I bought it, dubbed it, traded with a friend for Back in Black, and then Back in Black was really <laughs> the one that was like... Yeah, that's a full on. But I wore, I wore it for those about to rock out, too. I mean, some of that stuff is unreal on there. The song for those about to rock is how awesome is yeah. that song? It's, yeah. just, it's a classic arena. I mean, you hear that, you're just like, this is perfect. What a cool... Man. What did mom and dad say when you told them, hey, I don't want to play those. I need an electric guitar. Were they supportive? They go out and get it for you? Did you have to work all summer to get it? How uh, so I started out on my stepmom's acoustic for a minute. And I, I, they had me with an instructor that had the Simon and Garfunkel poster on the wall. And he was teaching me out of the method book learning to sight read E, F, and G on the high E string. And I was like, man, this isn't what I signed up for. Like, I, I was I was wanted to play guitar so I could be like that guy on MTV. And how does that happen? So I, I go over to my friend's house one day. I know he plays guitar. He's got an electric guitar, plugs it in, and he knows all the songs, right? He's playing all the Black Sabbath for me and all the Ozzy. And I'm like, it was like watching the sky get a crack in it, man. I mean, it was like, oh, the hell, did you, how'd you learn that? Like, and he was like, oh, I take from this guy at this store. So I, I, of course, went to that guy at that store, and I then I got an electric guitar. And uh, they, I had to show that I was dedicated to it before they'd buy me a practice amp. So I plugged directly into the home stereo, yeah. <laughs> cranked it up. Oh, man. <laughs> Playing, like, paranoid four hours a day, just the main <laughs> riff, like, well, he cranked on 10 on the home stereo. Now, what grade would you have been in at when you were doing that first starting out? Uh, seventh grade. Seventh grade. So during high school, were you in, like, local bands? Where did it progress uh, after yeah. that? I started with, like, little, like a jam with a drummer. Like there was a couple different times that happened. That was my band, like me and a drummer getting together to practice songs together or whatever. But then my first real band was junior year and I was 15 and I was out cry and we had our own songs. And I use the term loosely. <laughs> we had our own songs and we covered a lot of stuff. We did like, you know, docking. We loved the, to play cover and docking, did a lot of them. And, uh, and we would do these all ages shows like once every two, three weeks something like that. You'd flyer everywhere, all the music stores and try and get all the all people out. Um, so yeah, there you go. And then really from there, I was kind of not, they were like a band for me. And then it was a lot of recording music with my more like, I guess, talented friends. And um, I guess uh, having my parents growing up, I could always tell who were the people that were like, mm -hmm. that guy, that guy really plays great. So I was always drawn to that more than like, let's put together a band, even if half the band sucks. Like, yeah. I, <laughs> I, was, I still do that. 
I was like, that guy sucks. I don't want to do it. So going, you know, graduating high school, did you know that music is what you wanted to be your career or was there another path you were looking to go down? When did you know that music was really what you wanted to do? Um, yeah, probably when I learned paranoid, I mean, that, but, <laughs> but then it was in terms of making that decision. No, oh, man, I just kind of kept going with guitar. I knew I wanted to go to school, like two years of community college studying classical guitar, kind of like, tiptoeing towards that i'll get a diploma and get a job kind of guy right like if i even if i it's a music degree i'll still have a degree and so anyway i i was i did a couple years of community college and went to git which i wanted to do uh in hollywood that was my mm -hmm. first like go away from the chicago area and and quite a way to do it going to hollywood and spending 12 months out there and then i uh, stayed another year another 12 months essentially to work at cherokee studios and so by then it was too late to do anything else. I mean, I was barely making money, and I, I guess uh, I just didn't care. I was like, I don't care, man, whatever. What what the F else am I going to do? <laughs> it's kind of the way I looked at it. I, I look back and I go, hard times to get through, but it never really seemed that hard. I was yeah. young enough to just kind of enjoy it and go, well, I can always, I guess, bail and do something if I really had to, but I didn't want to have a plan B. The plan Bs are what everybody ends up doing. Mm. Yep. What year was you out there at the uh, out in Hollywood? So that was uh, ninety through ninety two. All right. So you're you spend that extra year there, ninety two. You is that you've graduated. You're working at you said Cherokee Studios. Where do you where do you go after that? Back to the Chicago area. Things got really hairy out there. The Rodney King riots went mm -hmm. down while I was out there, which was really quite scary when you're actually there. It's like being on the roof of our building and seeing every four or five buildings on fire around you is like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. and tanks going wow. down your street. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was heavy duty, man. That was heavy duty. Uh, of course, we're going through heavy duty stuff right now. Sure. So. But it was heavy duty at the time. I mean, I was only 20 years old or 21. <laughs> something like that. I was like, oh my God, am I getting out of this city alive? <laughs> so so when you went to Chicago, were you playing in local bands? Were you doing studio work? What was the, where did the career path take you when you went back lots, home? Lots of teaching. That was the first thing of like, all right, make a living. Let me get a bunch of students and then I'll start playing the gigs I want to play only, like with my band, and not worry about. I was younger, so I wasn't like I am now, where I'm like, let let's go, let's jam. Uh, so I was gigging like I would say once every week or two with my bands. At first, that band was called Black Bison, which I think the singer just threw the original cassette demo up on YouTube. If anybody wants to go, uh, what's that called? Uh, Black, Black Bison. So I'm. Sorry. I, I've even posted a couple of the tunes, but I on Facebook, I think I did it. Not sure I did it on YouTube, but I was uh, uh, 22 on that cassette or whatever. 22 years old songs that I wrote with the singer. And uh, and then a band called The Resin Diggers after that. And we were just a little bit more of like a everything goes kind of bar band, like funkier than Black Bison uh, was. And um, we were playing like, anywhere from disco to Frank Zappa, literally. And then I would come out and do uh, a lot of the rap that was popular at the time. Like I would do the Humpty dance with the glasses on and the nose and a big hat and uh, hard to believe. Right. And then we did a Coolio song where I would put the, you know, the, other hat. Like the pipe cleaners and that, but we were just, we were just young kids having fun and they, you know, playing the bar scene, all of our friends would turn up and we'd all get drunk and have a ball. And that was kind of the way it was. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that that Chicago scene, did you ever, you know, run into Eric or Christian who were also a Night Ranger? Christian and I met through the Kathy Richardson, Jim Peterick uh, land because I I started playing with Kathy Richardson who uh, we did really well there. This is like past that. So Black Bison, Resin yeah. Diggers little period of like wedding band being in a wedding band for a bit and then kathy richardson because uh, i was recording myself so i got in her band and through that jim peterick 
asked me to come in and do a couple things and record with him a little bit and uh and gosh from there so from there christian calling christian was in kathy richardson's band for like a minute while we transitioned i think why well, I, I was coming in and christian was leaving and i think she just didn't want to hire a new keyboard player uh as i recall but and then uh christian played with peter rick too so we knew each other but then eric and i somehow missed each other later in my Chicago tenure. So it was like Kathy Richardson, uh, but then also doing like these, uh, uh, I was in like an acid jazz band called Zugenic. And uh, that band had a residency downtown. And we're, Eric was in that same scene playing with, uh, I forget the name of the band he was in now. Gosh, sorry, Eric. Uh, <laughs> but we would gig at the Elbow Room, both bands. and uh, But we missed each other. It would be like different nights. But we, re we came to that realization after the fact. So now Kathy Richardson is is she in the new version like the Jefferson Starship? She's, she's singing with Jefferson Starship. Starship. Yeah. All right, all right. She's been doing it for a while now. That's that's yeah. been a bit. Well, they just yeah. released a new album, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. they got a new record coming yeah. out. And all that online. Yeah. 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 So when what drew? So you eventually end up moving to New York City. What? drove you from you know chicago to make that move what was the catalyst there and that was kathy richardson because she got the gig and the, the show love janice which is about janice joplin came to chicago kathy got the gig as janice joplin uh i did not get that gig because they had a band in place there and that was that but when she took the show to sag harbor which was like a little let's gather some money for the new york run kind of thing you, you put a show up for a couple weeks somewhere uh, they needed somebody to help the band through. Some of the guys were locals, and they weren't necessarily a, a, uh, at the level that they wanted them to be at. So they called me in last minute, I think two days before the first performance, and kind of whipped the band into shape and got them going and, and was the guy to have to always hold down the fort and play the songs right if everybody else kind of started mm -hmm. just forgetting where they were, that kind of thing. And uh, so anyway, I did that. And then that part of that was, yes, I'll do that, but I want to be hired for New York. And they said, you got it, you got it. You know, mm -hmm. Hired for New York. And so there you go. So, so, this, and then, yeah. so that was like a Broadway play based off of what, Janis Joplin's sister's book? Yeah, an off-Broadway an off musical uh, okay. that was basically letters that Janis wrote to home from the okay. time she yeah, was from San Francisco until the time she died, and so the gist of it was a letter what that she wrote around that period, some of the music that happened around that period, and so you could kind of listen to what she was going through, along with some like canned interviews that the actress would reenact and uh, things like that. So uh, yeah, that was the that was the way that worked. What was the big? Was there any big change, big difference from going from Chicago to New York City? I mean, I know they're both big cities but definitely different animals you know yeah I, I wasn't in chicago i was in the burbs of chicago mm -hmm. so i was never never lived in downtown chicago so for me it was a big difference i went from being a suburban kid uh i had of course i had my two years of living in hollywood so i wasn't completely like <laughs> yeah off the turnip truck so to speak or whatever but it, it uh it, yeah definitely new energy uh brand new era starting out here and and yeah, that show, I told my students at the time, I'm putting my stuff in storage out of my apartment. I'll be back in a couple months. Uh, just go take from these guys in the meantime. I think I had some teachers fill in even. It wasn't even like, I was looking at it like it only ran two months in Chicago. So I was like, this is going to be short lived and I'll be right back because I don't want to live in New York City. And uh, then it, the show ran for two years. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. By the time it closed, it was like... God, I guess I, I live here now. I mean, I've been here a while. <laughs> is, was New York City something that you fell in love with right away, or is it just something? I love that... it, of course. I can't stand it now, man. I mean, I, it's it's too much for me in terms of where I'm at in life and mm -hmm. what I do. And uh, it made a lot of sense when I was in Rock of Ages here, having that gig in town for six years and having something at home. But I, I make like virtually none of my money in new york city and like i'm, I'm like not really employed here so yeah. it's like living in the most expensive yeah. place in the country yeah. to pay rent and schools and taxes to not to be making my money in denmark yeah you can <laughs> <laughs> travel to make money 
Yeah, it doesn't make much sense, but whatever. I it's it makes sense for the family. Yeah. So where did the Love Janice take you to after that? Did you get any uh any other off Broadway shows or did you move in a different direction? Yeah, I kind of did. The uh I ended up through meeting people there having one of my subs play guitar and the drummer played drums in the Turtles. Uh so I did some I, well, not, not some gigs. I, I, I joined him. I mean, I was doing, I filled in for the guitar player. He was like, I got to miss some time to do this. And then as soon as his gig was ending, oddly enough, the bass player quit. And they liked me as a person. And they were like, do you play bass? And I was like, sure, let's do it. <laughs> I'm Mexican, I'm the bass player in the Turtles. I right, going boom, 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 boom. Happy together. Happy now, were both, both Flo and Eddie still on the Turtles? What's that? Was both Flo and Eddie still on the Turtles together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a great experience for me. It taught me a lot about just starting to get out and do fly dates and that experience of plug and play and step out sometimes in front of large crowds. It's sometimes not so large crowds, but it was it was anything goes with that circuit. But we did do some cool selling. Had a, had a tour called Hippie Fest with Mountain and we were playing amphitheaters and um, doing all that stuff. So great experience for me. Those guys are awesome. Really, really great guys. Um, Mark and Mark and Howard. What did, when you were doing that tour and touring that's probably about the first time you were touring nationally i would say right yeah yeah um, exactly kathy richardson would get some gigs here and there like we're going down to florida open for hootie and the blowfish and we'd go <laughs> on and we'd do like one show and come back and be like, we open for hootie and the blowfish <laughs> but it was like that was kind of it uh, there, there was no like we're going out on tour um and, and the turtles weren't like that either really just that one tour most of the stuff was like um, unless it was like a casino sit down for a few days or I mean a few nights. Um, but in general, it was kind of like just learning how to do fly dates where you were going to go. Um, and then during that time too, so the director took Love Janice to regional theaters. So I would go sit down and let's see, I did the show in totality. <laughs> see if I can remember this now. Uh, I did Tucson, Phoenix, uh, Louisville, Cleveland. Is that it? That might be it. Yeah. Uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. So I had sit downs in all those cities with it. And not just like going there for like a day or a week. It was like two months or three months in each city uh, to go and do that show. And then the director had another show called It Ain't Nothing But the Blues. And that was kind of just a, 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 like a timeline of the blues starting from slavery. So I wasn't necessarily part of it until like the second half. Like there was no electric guitar happening in the show. It was really more about uh, the chanting and how blues kind of developed and came about. And but that same deal, going to like regional theaters and going and sitting there. And during that time, I was balancing the turtles. So uh, there was uh, every city I'd get to, I'd have to say, all right, I got to find a sub in this city because I want to be able to go do these three or four turtles gigs that I have during this time. So it was my initial psychotic training of all the stuff that I've been doing ever since. Hey, Joel, did you find it hard um, when you're playing like Turtles music because you're such a virtuoso at the guitar? Do you find it hard to hold back and like think, oh, I would have done this here instead? Not necessarily, you know, not, not on bass, tapping like. and stuff, but I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, bass, I was lucky to make it through, man. I mean, it, but it was a good gig for, like I said, learning how to travel, understanding some of the de the decorum, the professionalism. Uh, those guys were extreme pros. I mean, they were like that, like in terms of band etiquette when you were around each other. Just great learning ground, not to uh, just how to how to work in a band, operate when you're what, traveling. What year would that have been when you were doing the sit downs and so that would be uh, two thousand. 2004, 2005, somewhere in there like that. All right. So now family life, were, were you married then, kids? How were you balancing whatever family? Well, Janice, she was the stage manager. So that was the big, like, oh, I guess I live here thing. Because <laughs> I met her, we were moved in. I was like, ah, I guess I live in New York now. Now I got to figure this out. Um, and to get back to the Turtles thing, that carried on a bit 
longer. I really did that all the way till Night Ranger. That was always wow. part of my thing all the way until then. I mean, that was part of my like yeah, email to those guys. Like, look, guys, I really have to know yeah. if we're going to do this because I, I have to let them know. I don't want to just bail on them. And so, yeah, anyway. So in 2001, you released a solo album, Undefined, which I thought I owned, but as I messaged you earlier today, I it either grew legs and walked away, so I went and ordered it off your website. Tell us, so what got you in, was that your first really recording professional that you released? I would say on a professional level, yeah. I, I, I did a bunch of recording on portable units at home and stuff, but that was my first, well, that rhythm section, some amazing players, Virgil Donati on drums, and, and uh, Virgil's an, uh, an artist, a virtuoso guy, not necessarily looking to play in, like, the mainstream bands. He's, like, just paving his way to, like, legendary status with playing level. Um, so uh, he, he's amazing. And, and my friend TJ Helmerich, who was my second guitar teacher, lived in L.A. He was working at Musicians Institute and head of the Recording Institute there. So he was like in, in charge of studio time, basically, with like real studios, SSLs and Eve consoles, not, you know, not a home recording type of setup. And anyway, him and Brett Garsid released some brilliant instrumental records and I hung out for, I think, I forget why I was in L.A., but I went out there for four or five days um, to hang out with them. They were rehearsing for a show they were going to do at MI, Brett and TJ, and they were using Virgil Donati on drums, and then this guy Rick Fiorabracci on bass. And uh, So not only did I jam a little in the rehearsal space with those guys, but then I think I filled in for Brett at Soundcheck because he couldn't make it. He had something else happening. Soundcheck for him, and at that time, Virgil and Rick were like, yeah, man, you know, great meeting you if you ever got anything you want us to play on. And I was like, wow, I should really do that. And then my friend TJ was like, of course you should, you idiot. I got free time to <laughs> record Virgil playing drums and get great sounds for you. And Rick can record at home. We don't even need him to be in the studio. And then we'll mix out here. So I just took song ideas that I had at that time, sent scratch tracks to Virgil, which scratch tracks are guitar tracks that are later going to go away. Because you once you get the drums, you usually record everything to those. Uh, so I sent the song forms to Scratch Guitars of Virgil and became that album. Now, wow. is was the second album, The Moon is Falling, is that something that just kind of transitioned during the, you're still doing the sit-downs and the uh, uh, and the turtles and just kind of a couple years later? Yeah, and we yeah do, it was right through it. And we do have like that. Look wacky, at that. Wacky, progressive music while I was playing Happy Together and playing mm -hmm. in Love Janus, absolutely. All those riffs happened backstage at Love Janus. I used to warm up an hour before every show, like, religiously. I was, like, insane back then, which doesn't sound like much if, like to normal touring schedule, but it was eight shows uh, a week, and I would do an hour at least before every show. Wow. Those were two hours, so two show days. I was hitting it hard for six hours at least, and then... Single show day is still hard for whatever mm. three hours. So the moon is falling, two thousand and three. So two thousand three and so forth up to you know two thousand six, two thousand seven. You're still doing the turtles. Uh, you work on thirteen acoustic songs. Autograph there, guys. Be jealous. Um, oh. Joel's not jealous. <laughs> <laughs> He can do it any time he wants. Um, so, two thousand. That's so. That's going to be two thousand six going into two thousand seven. That's right when you maybe start getting into the uh, Night Ranger world. Correct. Pretty close. Yeah. The way the way it worked was playing through Jim Peterick. Even though I had come out to New York, I would still do Jim Peterick's world stage gigs, which were only like once, tops twice a year. And he would have his guests come out. Jim is an amazing songwriter. Those that don't know him, he co-founded uh, Survivor, and he he founded the Eyes of March. So he wrote Vehicle when he yep. was seven years old, mm -hmm. and he, and Survivor, of course, co-wrote all those great hits, and uh, and then he even co-wrote those thirty-eight special songs we all know, Hold On Loosely and Caught Up in oh. You, and he wrote Heavy Metal with Sammy Hagar. He's a great, great songwriter. It's amazing. So he would have these events called World Stage, where there was the house band. And then the guys would come out, his friends, and sing their hits. There we go. Perfect. And so Kelly Kagi was the regular guest. He would come in. I'd see Kelly every year, like once a year, 
for like seven years. And then it was his wife at the time, Monique, was like, I said something about, you know, oh, man, I love Night Ranger. I mean, Brad and Jeff, she goes, oh, we don't, you know, that's he's not in the band anymore. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, what's going on there? And she was like, oh, you know, blah, 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 fallout, whatever. But, you know, we got Red Beach. And I was like, oh, okay, well, he's great. I was like, but you should have, they should have called me. I was like, I can do the eight finger technique and I'm playing a gold top Les Paul like Jeff. I was like, so I remember that night having a few drinks and going to Kelly, pointing at my phone going, you should have called me, man. You really should have. <laughs> and, uh, I think great. because I had those couple drinks and got that forward about it, amazingly enough, like two weeks later, I think Reb told them, guys, I got to miss a show because I got to play with Winger. And so I think they were looking at, well, what do we, I guess we got to cancel this show. And Kelly was like, wait a minute. He's like, Jim Peterick's got this guy who yeah. will learn like 36 songs and come in on no rehearsal and play down the whole show. Cause that's what the kind of craziness I was doing. I, at learning, I, I would spend weeks practicing the Peterick show every night and then just fly in one day and play a million songs. And so anyway, that was how I got my audition was a gig. I think they just didn't want to cancel the show and throw away a booked show because Reb had to play with Winger. And that and Kelly said at the time, like, well, it'd be cool if, if you could, you know, do really well because, you know, Reb is going to have to go back to White Snake at the time, so we're going to need somebody. And so, I mean, they didn't have to twist my arm. I was like, I'm going to kick ass on this thing. <laughs> I, like, and oddly enough, right at that same time, Michael Lardy had uh, gone back to Great White, so they needed a keyboard player. So this very same gig, Kelly was like, hey, do you know any keyboard players? I'm like, well, what about Jim's guy, Christian? So that was that was how it worked. And then gotcha. at that time, Michael Lardy was gone, but Reb was still had a gig. And so I got put on ice, even though I came in and kicked ass. They put me on ice for six months. Uh, <laughs> is what happened. I mean, I mean, I I did well, I think, for being like somebody who hadn't really been in the scene and hopping in on no rehearsal and it was scary as shit man i mean it was like jumping out of a plane not knowing if your parachute was going to open i was like oh my god do we know these songs in the same key do we is anything going to happen that i don't know what's going on and i i mean they had given me live recordings with jeff the live album with jeff and i just learned everything jeff did but there was stuff off of uh hole in the sun that they were doing with reb and I was getting like these board tapes from Japan where Brad and Jeff had planned out the guitar, or, uh, Brad and Reb had planned out the guitar parts different than were recorded on Hole in the Sun. So I'm busting my ass learning these harmony leads, not knowing which part I'm going to play. Like, am I going to play the high part or the low part? Guess I got to learn them both. And oh, then wow. getting the board tape and realizing they're not even playing that fucking solo. So oh. <laughs> I was so hard for that first gig. I mean, I really did. And then uh, it, it went well enough that I think they they in, they they liked me and gave me a shot at it at the start of 2008. Uh, uh, we're going to need those board tapes for some for, yeah. uh, some research, so I'll give uh, you my address when we get off air. So you base so what you're saying is you are the one that recommended Christian to the band. Yeah, I did. All right, you at that. At that time, you know, it was a, it was just a quick, literally a quick, well, what about Jim's guy, Christian? Like, I, I wasn't thinking I was actually getting him mm -hmm. gig, but when, when they said, like, all right, you guys are coming to do this show, we met in baggage claim in Detroit. It was a casino in Michigan. I can't remember where, but we landed. It was like where we met was baggage claim. We we're all coming off different flights, and I was like, outside of Kelly, and, and I might need to take it back because we had met, I'd met them, I'd met Jeff and Brad one time at Kathy Richardson Open for Night Ranger. And uh, it was a really, it was a weird gig. I remember my amp blew up on the gig and I had to like switch to a backup amp in the middle of the gig. But somehow Kelly comes up to me and he says, because we knew each other from Peter saying, he said, hey, Brad and Jeff said you sound really good, man. They want to meet you. And, <laughs> and uh, I remember being like, oh, my God, Jeff Watson and Brad Gillis want to meet me and going, <laughs> going to their dressing room, which was like an RV or something, right? And, and Brad and Jeff were both, like, just getting ready for the gig. And, uh, you know, just looked like deities to me. I was like, oh, my God, you know, like, complete fanboy and just uh, like, dude, thank you. I saw it. You guys are awesome. So this – and so 2007 – it was in Detroit, you're saying somewhere at a casino when you did that one one show, and then you don't hear from him until early 2008? 
No, I heard from them. They were just like, look, we have Reb has the dates for now. And I think they used the fact that it went well with me against him at the time to prod him a little bit. Like, <laughs> that guy, kid came in and did really well, man. You better watch your back. <laughs> kind of thing but you know whatever dude it was it was it, i i totally get it. i mean reb was doing a good job on the gig of course because he's a great player but uh at the same time like they'd given him the dates he was in white a bigger name he's in white saying more established it just i i kind of had to just wait my turn that's just the way that's the way the music business works do you remember when they contacted you and said do you want to join if that was really me contacting kelly by email a lot and i at that time uh it was so i had a bunch of stuff going on i was like love janice was going to go up again in a city i think and the turtles were playing and i think uh henry paul at the time was talking to me about maybe joining outlaw oddly enough wow uh so i said to kelly like look man i have to figure out what what my year what i'm gonna do um and i said you guys have I mean, I'm dying to be in the band. Just hire me, you know? And so they, they did. <laughs> like, it's going to be good, man. Uh, so, yeah, they gave me a crack at it then. That was beginning 2018, like right out of the gate. So, um, Do you remember right. what? I mean, 2008. Say 18? Oh, my gosh, 2008. Yeah. 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 Um, do you remember what your first, where your first gig was when you, your, your first show in 2008? Yeah, uh, that was, oh gosh, why can't I think of the name now? It was with Dennis DeYoung and uh, the Florida, oh, why can't I think of the damn name now? It's, uh, but it's it's like a an indoor theater, that kind of, uh, oh, good Lord. But I know the second gig was at Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> All right. Really? Wow. I feel like Googling while we're on it. It would just be so unsightly. But, uh, yeah, it was in Florida. Then we went and did Guantanamo Bay. And then it was another gig in Florida. So in Guantanamo, was that the first time you'd ever met Ted Nugent? Was he on that gig? He wasn't there. No? He had, All right. He wasn't on the gig. All right. Well, we'll just jump ahead. Have you ever met Ted Nugent? <laughs> I have. When, um, when we played the Taylor booth... One of the years, there was also uh, a little mini uh, Damn Yankees reunion. So, yeah, I, I talked to them a little bit. I, I first introduced myself to him that that was going to happen, but I ran into him in the main hall at Nam, and I said, "Hi, Ted, uh, Joel Hofstra. I work, you know." And and he was he was Ted, just like you'd expect. <laughs> total, yeah, total uh, <laughs> crazy genius, the madman, right? Motor City madman. So what? How cool was it? when you saw your first group photo with night ranger what? oh man too cool so cool so cool <laughs> yeah I, it took me a while to wrap my head around it all you know it was like i'd be talking with brad at the bar after a gig and i'd be like i know you're probably gonna have another guitar player in like next week or whatever right? he's like you don't get it man it's your gig like you got it i'm like no no i know because in like two weeks you're gonna tell me you got somebody else and so it was that kind of feeling. Now, was the when you was a Night Ranger, was that the first time you'd ever seen yourself on a tour shirt? Yes. That yeah, had that's to, cool. That had to be cool, too. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think, uh, what was it, Brent? You told a cool story about, I think, Gene Simmons when you used to ask him of all the stuff they've ever, you know, done. I, I was on Rockline. I got I got through to Kiss on Rockline, that radio show. And I, and I have... Huge Kiss Museum upstairs. And I'm looking at it thinking, what question can I ask them? And I thought, hey, what's the coolest piece of merchandise you have? And you know, a silence goes around and Paul goes, Gene? He goes, I'd say it'd have to be the T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, it does have some... You know, it's, it's basically... It's behind it. Yeah, your band. Someone's out there wearing your band or your face on their, on their shirts. So... Got our uh, fans a motion shirt. Yeah, yeah, it's always cool. I, I, I still love that stuff. Are you mm -hmm. kidding? It's amazing to me. So when we talk, you know, when we're you know bullshitting on the podcast and stuff, we kind of refer to as the years from like ninety nine to oh seven oh eight, kind of as like the lost years. There was no Night Ranger. There was Hole in the Sun, but there was really no Night Ranger studio albums in the early parts of the year. 
they did real sporadic touring and it was usually just rib fests and stuff like that and i to me personally it was almost like a rebirth somewhere right around 2008 and 2009 to me it was night ranger was something different than what they were previously and i think the big first jump was you guys did a tour with journey and it was the first time night ranger had really went back and played arenas uh was that your first big you know arena tour with a couple of like smaller arena things before the 2000 the big 2011 one where we were out with sticks and ario yep. and little uh, like mini runs not like we're going to go on tour for six months that was that 2011 was definitely like a big benchmark because we had the record coming out and everything like that too so that yeah it changed but we had done some bigger shows and i i had played bigger shows by that point in time i wasn't like unnerved by it night ranger was always like on the go for like plugging in if whatever tesla couldn't be on the bill with so and so and we were always the band to go grab those gigs and add it into whatever dates the guys were were booking so we i i was by that time, I was like, let's go, man. I mean, I'd been in the band for three years. How cool was it when you guys did that 2009, I think 2009 tour with Styx and Ario Speedwagon? And at the very end, you guys would all go out on stage together. That had to be kind of mind blowing as well. Incredible, man. Yeah. Yeah. Totally incredible. All like just awesome life memories, man. Looking back on all that stuff's just great. And. So Night Ranger makes a big decision in 2011 to record a new studio album. Hole in the Sun, recorded in 2007 with Jeff Watson. It's one of those albums that fans are very opinionated on. A lot of people will say that, you know, it wasn't quite the Night Ranger sound. So you, when do you first get word that, hey, we think we're going to go in and do a new studio album and you're going to be involved. How did that process go down? It was right about the top of that year, as I recall, because that's when Christian quit. And I was like, why is he quitting now, man? We're going to record an album <laughs> we're with Journey and Foreigner. Bad time to quit. Uh, How about that, everybody? Hey, I just got a text message. Um, the <laughs> the end of part one of our interview with Joel Hoekstra. Brent, what did you think? What did you think? Well, what I really loved was how he loved the artwork. I felt, felt really appreciated tonight, you know? It, well, actually, last night when we recorded it, it that blew me away how much um, he went off on it. And for all you that don't know, it's so damn hard to fit that many letters. That that's it. That's that's the um, that's the capper right there. I love the fact that um, baseball talk. That was pretty fun. Eh, Cubs suck. He lost me there. Eh. Once he's told yeah. me he's a Cubs fan, I, the rest like the other hour and forty minutes suck because all I can think about is how much the Cubs suck. Well. Now the question is, did we show him that logo in part one? Yeah. We did? All right. I don't remember. Yeah, it's right at the beginning. All right. Right at the beginning. And what I wanted to do, but the interview moved so damn fast, I wanted to interject and ask him about the Big Red Machine. We're both, we know we're both Ohio boys. And he was born, what, 1970? I'm 68. Yeah, 1970. You, you really missed the Big Red Machine, didn't you? I did. I did. I mean, I, I still got to see, you know, Pete Rose, um, late, obviously later in his prime, but. I got to see Davey Concepcion and Ken Griffey. So those guys were still yeah, hanging on. They were still around. But, uh, yeah, I didn't get to watch any of those those you know, mid-'70s uh, series. So if you're new to the page, go to, go to the subscribe button. Um, we release different podcast episode every Tuesday. Part two of this episode will be released next Tuesday. I would suggest you also go to joelhoekstra.com, go to the store. 
some of the CDs that we talked, some of the music that we talked about in this episode, and definitely music that we talk about in the next episode are all on his page, reasonably priced. Very cheap. Yeah, you can get autographed photos as well. So go to his uh, web web store and get yourself some Joel Hoekstra goodies. And, and he, he'll keep making this music as long as people were buying it. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we're, his, we're his target audi- audience. All, all these artists, we need to support them. Exactly, especially at times like this when there is no, I mean, these a lot of these artists make their money doing the touring. And when that's been wiped out, it's, uh, it's this is definitely a time for you if you, whichever artist you enjoy, you know, go to their web store, purchase T-shirt, CD, mug, whatever. And join us next Tuesday. We will have part two. And if you are here you know, from a White Snake or Trans Siberian Orchestra page, or even a Share page, or a Share fan, or an Echo Bats fan, or Echo Bats fan. Oh, that reminds me. People in Australia, keep downloading the song, keep it on the radio. Yep. Also, he said the UK. UK I think is uh, is it's still in the charts. America, section. download it. Yep. Get with the program. That, that song people. is fantastic. Get with the program, and. Coming up, like I said, we got Joel Hoekstra Part 2 next week. I think we're going to, the next album focus, obviously, chronologically, is Big Life. That's going to be coming up. Look at, you're already smiling, happy, happy album. Um, it's a great album. So, until then, we will see I you. I can take a liking to Big Life. <laughs> Sorry. All until right. then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, better let it go. Um, so. <sighs> Carry on. Anyways, that's the secret of my success, the way I do this, you know. Yep, love is not standing near. Um, (laughs) But uh, anyways, if anyone's still listening, we apologize. Join us next week. Hope you enjoyed this week. Joel, thanks for doing the interview. Come back next week for part two. Until then, come on, give me a Paul Stanley line or something. People, you ain't got to go home, but you can't stay here. People! <laughs> look Let me you, tell you something. I at, was walking down the street. Look at yourself. I, just, you're, you're I beautiful. was just walking down the street, and some wild animals came up to me and said, Paul. Oh, there was that one, that one Paul went back during Thanksgiving. Paul, why don't you come over for Thanksgiving dinner? I said, baby. I'll be there. She opens the door, and I said, she goes, Paul, what did you bring? He goes, I brought the perfect stuffing. (laughs) (laughs) There you go, guys. Brent's Paul Stanley impersonation. Everybody, clap your hands. You a bunch of hand clappers. Look at you guys, a bunch of hand clappers. (laughs) (laughs) That's great shit. (laughs) Love Paul (laughs) Stanley. All right, until next week, folks. Later. Dream, I wanna hear you scream. I drag you to the deepest depths, the darkest nights, and scariest of scenes. Dreams, tell me all your dreams.